Hi, I'm still here. Hang on. I just have to do something here. Okay, um, now, let's see, I have no idea why the sound has been having problems again, but let's see what we can figure out. Okay, that's gone. I have lost my sound bar. Hello. Um, I have no idea. I really don't. That was my fault. I was trying to do something. Um, so I accidentally knocked out one of the, uh, one of the cords and the whole thing went down. So anyway, um, sorry about that. And let me think here if there's anything I can do to improve the sound. Um, well, it sounds like it's working better. I'll leave it alone then. I will leave it alone. I'll wait for everybody to get back. Oh, Lordy. Um, it's the Grail Brotherhood. Yeah, it is. Or either that or it's the, uh, or the Norns, as someone else suggested. Um, anyway, uh, I have no idea why the sound would be working better now. That doesn't make sense. Um, I didn't do anything except knocked it offline. Maybe, I don't know, maybe sometimes the connections between me and um, Facebook are just better than others. I, I have no idea. I, as I said, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm mystified by all the weird things that can go wrong. I really am. Okay. Anyway. Um, so I'm not touching anything. I'm not touching you. I'm not touching you. Um, you remember that when kids used to do that? Um, a, what else am I going to tell you about? So, for those of you who were already with me, I won't reiterate, most of you probably were. Um, so I'm glad you're here. Um, I hope the sound is good. I'm gonna say hello to people and uh, then I'm gonna start reading because I've got uh, some stuff ahead of me. And also, yeah, hang on, let me just quickly check my phone. And don't, I, I, I don't go away. Stop it. Okay, so I'm gonna quickly, while I'm wasting time over here trying to figure out if the, uh, if the person got picked up and if that all happened and if my attempts to communicate with the, uh, the Lyft moguls. Oh dear, okay, <laughs> he's still on the bus. Um, that means that the, oh God, help us. Okay. Anyway, not much I can do right at the moment. So I'm going to continue and I'm going to re, I'm going to say hello to everybody. So let me check in with everybody who said hello. Um, Becca, Becca's first on the, the rebuilt, um, thing. And so hello, Becca. How are you? Claudia. Hello. Hello. Kristen. Good to see you. Emily. A pleasure. Angie. Hi again. Uh, Tracy, good, good to see you. Ron, hi Ron. <laughs> what, 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 what craziness. Matthew, welcome back. Well, thank you, it's good to be back. Um, Soren, hello Soren, good to see you. Christy, yes, we are back. Medardo, hello, hello. Yes, the norms are bloody tricky. Tiffany, still here too. Good, 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 good. All right, glad to hear it. Isaac, hello from dark and snowy Cache Valley, or Cache Valley, or Cache Valley, if it's an American, Native American word. Uh, could be pronounced any number of ways, but we'll say Cache or Cache. Anyway, um, who else? Jared, hello. Sound is better. I'm glad to hear it. It's extremely complicated. Um, 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 who else we got? Carl. Hello, Carl. Good to see you. And Tim, a group hug. Yeah. Um, 
yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, my poor car. Yeah, that's a whole other story. Um, anyway, thank you for the kind words. No, I don't need a group hug. I just need to manage to get through the reading and, and have it work the way it's supposed to work um, with my brand new expensive, uh, well, you know, expensive in the way that these things are. Not expensive like a new computer, but, it, you know, another 150 bucks worth of worth of uh, little peripheral things that have to be added. Um, let me see, who else have I not said hello to yet? Tim, Tim, Tiffany, Pierre, Susan. Hello, Susan. Good to see you. Ray, did I say hello to you yet? If not, hello. And Penny. Hello, Penny. Let me see. And Sandra is checking in from Western Australia. So that's good to know, and it's good to hear. I'm always pleased to hear from my friends in the Antipodes. And so what I'm going to do, um, let me, let me write one last text. And then I will start reading. I'm still here. I'm just giving instructions. Um, Dun, dun, dun. This has got to be the most riveting live broadcast anybody has ever done. Watch Tad text in real time. Um, oh, shut up. God, I don't want your stupid little messages. And I certainly don't want them in the middle of trying to type something with one hand. Okay. Um, anyway, so I, I, the 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 person who is supposed to be being picked up, which I had to make several different um, uh, reservations for, um, his train is delayed. There's no way to contact the driver that I can find out without getting back online with the website. So basically, I just told him to take a cab if necessary. Of course, it'll cost three times as much. But hey. Life is for the living, right? Right. Okay. Um, anyway, so with that, I am going to start reading. And what I am reading here is chapter 29, Hunters and Hunted. And thank you for your patience. I appreciate you all putting up with this. It was not my choice. I only found out in the middle of the afternoon that um, Deb could not go and pick up our one of our young people. In, uh, across the hills, on the other side of the hills. And uh, as a result, I have been scrambling around trying to decide whether I was going to cancel the reading and do it myself because our other young person was out of the house at a job thing or whether I could arrange, uh, you know, a Lyft, an Uber, one of that. And then, of course, that has turned out to be an absolute nightmare. Anyway, so that's why the distractions. It was not something I had planned on. Uh, chapter 29, Hunters and Hunted. The hollow roar. Oh, by the way, for those of you who were not with me last night, I want a quick update. Simon, Maria, and Binibic, uh, and of course the wolf, Kantaka, have uh, gotten, were in uh, Daichikiza, the abandoned Sithi city, when suddenly they discovered that they were again being pursued, this time by Urkenlandish soldiers and the unpleasant uh, storm spike hounds. And just as they were running away into the city, uh, Binibic fell down and had been shot, had been pierced with an arrow. And that's the end of the last chapter. The hollow roar of the river filled his ears. For a heartbeat, it seemed to Simon that the water was the only moving thing, that the archers on the far side, Maria, he himself, all had been frozen into immobility 
by the impact of the arrow that quivered in Binibic's back. Then another shaft spat past the white-faced girl, splintering noisily against a broken cornice of shining stone, and all was frantic movement once more. Only half aware of the insect-like scuttling of the archers across the water, Simon covered the distance back to the girl and troll in three steps. He bent to look, a strange, isolated part of his mind, noticing how the boy's leggings Mario wore had tattered holes at the knee, and an arrow snicked through his shirt beneath his arm. At first he thought it had missed him completely. A moment later he felt a flare of pain sizzle along his rib cage. More darts skimmed past, hitting low on the tiles before them and skipping like stones on a lake. Simon quickly kneeled and scooped the silent troll into his arms, feeling the horrible, stiff arrow quiver between his fingers. He turned, putting his back between the little man and the archers. Binibic was so pale. He was dead, he must be. Then stood. The pain in his ribs burned him again and he staggered. Maria catching at his elbow. Locan's blood, screamed the black-garbed Ingen, his far-off voice a faint murmur in Simon's ear. You're killing them, you idiots. I said to keep them there. Where's Baron Hayferth? Kentaka had run down to join them. Maria tried to wave the wolf away as she and Simon lumbered up the stairs into Dai Chikiza. One last feathered shaft cracked into the step behind them. Then the air was still again. Hayforth is here, Rimba's men, a voice shouted amid the clamor of armored men. Simon looked back from the top step. His heart sank. A dozen men in battle array were rushing past Ingen and his bowmen, heading straight for the gate of stags, the bridge Simon and his companions had passed beneath just before coming ashore. The baron himself rode behind them on his red horse, a long spear held above his head, they couldn't have outrun even the foot soldiers for long. The Baron's horse would catch them in three breaths. Simon, run! Mario jerked his arm, pulling him forward at a stumble. We must hide in the city! But Simon knew that was hopeless, too. By the time they reached the first concealment, the soldiers would be upon them. Hey, Firth! Ingen Jagger's voice cried out behind them, a flat, small sound above the river's drone. You can't! Don't be a fool, Erkenlander, your horse! The rest was lost in water sounds. If Hayforth heard, he did not seem to care. In a moment, the clangor of his soldiers' feet upon the bridge was matched by the pounding of hoofbeats on stone. Even as the din of pursuit mounted, Simon caught the toe of his boot on an uprooted tile and pitched forward. A spear in the back, he thought to himself in mid-fall, and... How did all this happen? Then he was tumbling painfully onto his shoulder, rolling to protect the cradled body of the troll. He lay on his back, staring up at the patches of sky gleaming through the dark dome of trees. Benedict's not insubstantial weight perched on his chest. Mario was pulling at his shirt, trying to get him upright. He wanted to tell her it was not important now, no longer worth the bother, but as he sat up on one elbow, propping the troll's body with his other arm, he saw a strange thing happening below. In the middle of the long, arching bridge, Baron Hayforth and his men had stopped moving. No, that was not quite correct. They were swaying in place. The men-at-arms clinging to the bridge's low walls, the Baron perched atop his horse, his features not quite distinguishable from this distance, but his pose that of a man who is startled out of sleep. A moment later, for no reason Simon could discern, the horse reared and plunged forward. The men followed, running faster than before. Immediately after, a flicker behind the movement, Simon heard a great crack, as though a giant hand had snapped off a tree trunk for a toothpick. The bridge seemed to come unstuck in the middle. Before the shocked, fascinated eyes of Simon and Maria, the slender gate of stags plunged downward, middle first, stones crumbling loose in great angular shards to crash, foaming into the water below. 
For a few pulse beats, it seemed that Hayforth and his soldiers would reach the far side. Then, rippling like a shook-out blanket, the arc of stone folded in on itself, sending a writhing mass of arms, legs, pale faces, and, th and a thrashing horse toppling down amidst the ragged blocks of milky Chalcedony to disappear in gouts of green water and white froth. A few moments later, the head of the baron's horse appeared several ells downstream, neck straining upward, then it slid back into the swirling river. Simon slowly tilted his head around to the base of the bridge. The two archers were on their knees, staring into the torrent. The black-hooded figure of Ingen stood behind them, staring across at the companions. It felt like his pale eyes were only inches away. Get up! Maria shouted, pulling at Simon's hair. He freed his gaze from Ingen Jaggers with an almost palpable snap of separation, like a cord fraying through. He climbed to his feet, balancing his small burden, and they turned and fled into the echoes and tall shadows of Dai Chiquiza. Simon's arms were aching after a hundred steps, and it felt as though a knife was sliding in and out of his side. He fought to stay even with the girl as they followed the bounding wolf through the ruins of the Sithi city. It was like running through a cave of trees and icicles, a forest of vertical shimmer and dark, mossy corruption. Shattered tile was everywhere, and massive tangles of spider webs strung across beautiful crumbling arches. Simon felt as though he had been swallowed by some incredible ogre with innards of quartz and jade and mother of pearl. The river sounds became muted behind them. The rasp of their own hard breathing vied with the scrape of their running feet. At last, it seemed they were reaching the outskirts of the city. The tall trees, hemlock and cedar and towering pine, were closer together, and the tiled flooring that had been everywhere underfoot now dwindled to pathways coiling at the feet of the forest giants. Simon stopped running. His eyesight was blackening at the edges. He stood in place and felt the earth reel about him. Maria took his hand and led him a few limping steps to an ivy-choked mound of stone that Simon, his sight slowly returning, recognized as a well. He set Binibic's body down gently on the pack that Maria had been carrying, propping the little man's side against the rough cloth, then leaned on the well's rim to suck air into his needy lungs. His side continued to throb. Maria squatted next to Binibic, pushing away Kantaka's nose as the wolf prodded at her silent master. Kantaka took a step back, making a whimpering sound of incomprehension, then lay down with her muzzle on her paws. Simon felt hot tears spring to his eyes. He's not dead. Simon stared at Maria, then at Binibic's colorless face. What? he asked. What do you mean? He's not dead she repeated without looking up. Simon kneeled beside her. She was right. The troll's chest was moving almost imperceptibly. A frothy bubble of blood on his lower lip pulsed in time. Cusiris, Adon! Simon wiped his hands, hand across his dripping forehead. We have to take the arrow out. Maria looked at him sharply. Are you mad? If we do, the life will run out of him. He'll have no chance at all. No, Simon shook his head. The doctor told me. I'm, I'm sure he did. But I don't know if I can get it out anyway. Help me to take off his jacket. When they had pried cautiously at the jacket for a moment, they realized there was no possible way to remove it without pulling on the arrow. Simon cursed. He needed something to cut the jacket away, something sharp. He pulled the salvaged pack over by a strap and began to rummage through it. Even in his sorrow and pain, he was gratified to discover the white arrow still wrapped in its shroud of rags. He pulled it out and began loosening the knot that held the strips of cloth. What are you doing? Maria demanded. Haven't we had enough arrows? I need something sharp to cut with, he grunted. It's a 
pity we've lost part of Benedict's staff. It, it's the part that's got a knife in it. Is that what you're doing? Maria reached into her shirt and pulled out a small knife in a leather sheath, hung on a thong around her neck. Jaloy told me I should have it, she explained, unsheathing it and passing it over. It's not much good against archers, and bowmen aren't much good at keeping bridges from falling. Praise God. Simon began to saw away at the oiled hide. Do you think that's all that happened? Maria said after a while. What do you mean? Simon panted. It was hard work, but he had cut upward from the bottom of the jacket and passed the arrow, revealing a sticky mass of congealed blood. He pulled the knife blade up toward the collar. That the bridge just fell. Maria looked up at the light filtering down through the twining greenery. Maybe the Scythi were angry about what was happening in their city. <sighs> Simon clenched his teeth and spit the last piece of, split the last piece of hide. The Scythi who are alive don't live here anymore. And if the Scythi don't die like the doctor told me, then there aren't any spirits to make bridges fall. He spread the wings of the split jacket and winced. The troll's back was covered in drying blood. You heard the Rimmersman shouting at Hayfirth. He didn't want him to take his horse on the bridge. Now, let me think, damn you. Maria raised her hand as though to strike him. Simon looked up and their eyes locked. For the first time, he saw that the girl, too, had been crying. I gave you my knife, she said. Simon shook his head, confused. It's, it's just that that devil Ingen may have already found another place to cross. He's got two archers, at least, and... Who knows what's become of the hounds, and, and and this little man is my friend. He turned back to the bloodied troll. Mario was silent for a moment. I know, she said at last. The arrow had entered at an angle, striking a good hand's length from the center of the spine. By carefully tilting the small body, Simon was able to slide his hand underneath. His fingers quickly found the sharp iron arrowhead protruding from just below Binibic's arm near the front of his ribs. Blazes, it's gone right through him, Simon thought frantically. A moment, a moment. Break the point off, Maria suggested, her voice now calm. Then you can pull it through more easily, if you're sure you should. Of course. Simon was elated and a bit dizzy. Of course! It took him no little time to cut through the arrow beneath its head. The little knife had been considerably dulled. When he finished, Maria helped him tilt Binibic into the position where the arrow was most flexible. Then, with a silent prayer to the Adon under his tongue, he eased the arrow out through the wound made by its entry as fresh blood welled around it. He stared at the hateful object for a moment, then threw it away. Kintaka raised her massive head to watch its flight, gave a rumbling moan, and slumped back down. They wrapped Binibic in the rags from the white arrow, along with strips cut from his ruined jacket. Then Simon picked up the still faintly breathing troll and cradled him. Jaloy said, climb the stile. I don't know where that is, but we'd best continue on to the hills, he said. Maria nodded. The glimpses of sun through the treetops told them it was near noontime as they left the overgrown well. They passed quickly through the fringes of the decaying city, and within an hour found the land beginning to slope upward beneath their weary feet. The troll was again becoming a difficult burden. Simon was too proud to say anything, but he was sweating profusely, and his back and arms had begun to ache fully as much as his wounded side. Maria suggested that he cut leg holes in the pack so that it could be used to carry Binibic. After some consideration, Simon discarded the idea. For one thing, it would mean too much jouncing for the helpless, unconscious troll. Also, they would have to leave some of the pack's contents behind, and most of that was food. 
When the gently rising land began to change into steep, brushy slopes of sedge and thistle, Um, sorry. Or did I lose, lose it there? Um, when the gently rising land began to change into steep, brushy slopes of sedge and thistle. Oh, for God's sakes. Really, are we having sound problems again? I haven't changed anything here on this end. Oh, mercy. Okay, hang on just a quarter of a second. Let me see if there's anything obvious going on. No, there's nothing attached to it. There shouldn't be anything. Okay. All right. That's the only thing I can think of. I hope that has it in. It's crackling and buzzing. Is it still crackling and buzzing? Still. Let's try that and see if that works. I don't want any sound there. It's still crackling and buzzing. Is it still? It's also gone out of focus. Hello. Yes. Oh, for God's sakes. Oh, this is so frustrating. And right in the middle of all the action. Um, let me see if there's anything I can change here. Sound is off on that. Sound preferences, input volume, input level, input level there, okay, that's good, output level off, should be muted now, shouldn't be any problem with that, I have no idea why it's doing that, what happens if I move that? They're still understandable. Yeah, I, I, I understand being understandable, but I don't want to. I mean, we're trying to record these for other people to listen to also. <coughs> well, <laughs> Ray, I probably do, Ray, but then again, I used to have a PC, and I had a lot of problems with that, too, so maybe it's just me. Okay, strong microphone, Yeti Nano. All right. I have no idea why that's doing what it's doing. I really don't. But I don't want that. Okay. All right. Okay, but I don't want sound input. I want sound output. So let's, no, let's just mute that. Wait, volume, okay, all right, there should be sound now, presumably, um, no sound at all, can't hear anything, no, here I am, okay, good, sorry guys, uh, still can't hear? Okay, noise and so static. I have no, I have idea, no idea what is causing the static here. I really don't, I really know. don't know. I really, can't I really can't tell you. Tell you. Hang on, hang on. I'm going to try one other thing. Don't go away, don't go away.
Okay, how about that? Is that sound back on? If not, I'm going to have to start doing it in interpretive dance. Can you hear me now, said Tad. Yeah, just like those commercials. Okay, we've got sound. Is it still super staticky? Yes, still staticky, or yes, you can hear me. Okay, well, I'm going to continue reading because there's nothing more I can do except just doing, <laughs> just doing my best. All right, uh, I have no idea where we got lost. Okay, seems clear now. Maybe my micro, my expensive microphone is bad. Okay, um, so go for it, interpretive dance. Jaloy said, climb the stile. I don't know where that is, but we'd best continue on into the hills, he said. Maria nodded. The glimpses of sun through the treetops told them it was near noontime as they left the overgrown well. They passed quickly through the fringes of the decaying city, and within an hour found the land beginning to slope upward beneath their weary feet. The troll was again becoming a difficult burden. Simon was too proud to say anything. Um, Simon was too proud to say anything, but he was sweating profusely, and his back and arms had begun to ache fully as much as his wounded side. Maria suggested that he cut leg holes in the pack so that it could be used to carry Binnebeck. After some consideration, Simon discarded the idea. For one thing, it would mean too much jouncing for the helpless, unconscious troll. Also, they would have had to leave some of the pack's contents behind, and most of that was food. When the gently rising land began to change into steep, brushy slopes of sedge and thistle, Simon at last waved Maria to a stop. He set the little man down and stood for a moment, hands on hips, sides puffing in and out as he got back his breath. We, we must, I must rest, he huffed. Maria looked up at his flushed face with sympathy. You can't carry him all the way to the top of the hills, Simon, she said gently. It looks to get steeper ahead. You'll need your hands to climb with. He's my friend, Simon said stubbornly. I can do it. No, you can't, Maria shook her head. If we can't use the pack to carry him, then we must... Her shoulders slumped, and she slid down to sit on a rock. I don't know what we must, but we must, she finished. Simon sagged down beside her. Kantaka had disappeared up the slope, bounding nimbly along where it would take the boy and girl long minutes to follow. Suddenly an idea came to Simon. Kantaka, he called, rising to his feet and spilling the pack out on the grassy ground before him. Kantaka, come here. Working feverishly, the unspoken thought of Ingen Jaeger, a hovering shadow, Simon and Maria wrapped Binnebeck up neck to toe in the girl's cloak, then balanced the troll, stomach down on Kantaka's back, tying him in place with the last shredded strips of clothing from out of the pack. Simon remembered the position from his involuntary ride to Duke's Grimner's camp, but he knew that if the thick cloak was between Binnebeck's ribs and the wolf's back, the little man would at least be able to breathe. Simon knew it was not a good situation for a wounded, probably dying troll, but what else could be done? Mario was right. He would need his hands going up the hill. Once Kentaka's initial skittishness wore off, she stood passively as the boy and girl worked, turning occasionally to try and sniff Binnebeck's face where it bobbed at her side. When they finished and started up the slope, the wolf picked her way carefully, as if aware of the importance to her silent burden of a smooth ride. Now they made better time, scrambling over stones and ancient logs, molting their bark in steep peeling strips. The bright cloud-blurred ball of sun that peered down through the branches had rolled far toward its western mooring. Scrabbling along, the wolf's gray and white tail floating before, his sweat-smarting eyes like a plume of smoke, Simon wondered where the darkness would find them and what might find them in that darkness. The going 
had become very steep, and both Simon and Mario were beribboned with scratch marks from the clutching undergrowth when they at last stumbled across a clear horizontal crease in the side of the hill. They sat down gratefully in the dusty track. Kentaka looked as though he would not mind exploring further up the narrow, grass-clotted trail, but instead she slumped beside them, tongue lolling. Simon untied the troll from the makeshift harness. The little man's condition seemed unchanged, his breathing still terribly shallow. Simon dribbled water into his mouth from the water skin, then passed it to Maria. When she had finished, Simon cupped his hands, which she filled, and held them out for Kantaka to drink. Afterward, he took several long swallows from the bag himself. Do you think this is the style? Maria asked as she ran her hands through her damp black hair. Simon smiled weakly. Wasn't that like a girl to be arranging her hair in the midst of the forest? She was very flushed, and he saw that it brought out the freckles across the bridge of her nose. It looks more like a deer path or some such, he said at last, turning his attention to where the track wandered away along the flank of the hill. I, I think the style is a Sithy thing, Jaloy said, but I think we might follow this for a while. She's not really thin so much, he thought. It's more what they call delicate. He remembered how she reached up and snapped off the overhanging branches and her coarse river chanties. No, maybe delicate wasn't quite it either. Let's be off then. Maria broke into his ruminations. I'm hungry, but I'd rather not be out in the open here when the sun goes down. She stood up and began collecting the cloth strips to remount Binibic on his steed, who was using her last moments of unencumbered freedom to scratch behind one ear. I like you, Maria, Simon blurted out, and then wanted to turn away, to run, to do something. Instead, he bravely stayed where he was, and a moment later, the girl looked up at him, smiling. And she was the one who looked embarrassed. I'm glad, was all she said, and then moved away up the deer track a few steps to let Simon, hands suddenly clumsy, bind Binibic into place. Suddenly, as he finished tying the last loop beneath the shaggy belly of the hugely patient wolf, he looked at the troll's bloodless face as slack and still as death, and was angry with himself. What a moon calf, he thought savagely. One of your closest friends is dying. You're lost in the middle of nowhere, being chased by armed men, and maybe worse. And here you stand, moping over a skinny servant girl. Idiot! He did not say anything to Maria as he caught up with her, but the expression on his face must have told her something. She gave him a pensive look, and they fell into stride with no further conversation. The sun had dipped down behind the ridged backs of the hills when the deer path began to widen. Within a quarter of a league, it became a broad, flat path that might have once been used for wagon travel, although it had long since given over sovereignty to the creeping wilderness. Other, smaller tracks wound alongside, distinguishable mainly as flaws in the smooth cover of brush and trees. They came to a place where these lesser pathways joined with theirs, and within a hundred ells found themselves walking again on ancient stone tiles. Soon after, they reached the stile. <coughs> the wide, cobbled roadway cut across the track they had been following, switching back and forth up the hill in a steep traverse. Tall grasses pushed up between the cracked gray and white tiling, and in places large trees had grown right through the road's surface, shouldering the stones up and outward as the trees gained size, so that each was now surrounded by a small slag heap of uprooted stone. And this will take us to Naglamond, Simon said half to himself. They were the first words either had spoken for a long time. Maria was about to reply when something on the hilltop caught her eye. She stared, but whatever had made the flash of light was gone. Simon, I think I saw something bright up there. She pointed to the crest of the hill, a good league above them. 
What, what was it? he asked, but she only shrugged. Armor? Perhaps, if the sun would reflect the slate in the day? He answered himself. Or the walls of Naglamond? Or, or who knows? He looked up, narrowing his eyes. We can't leave the road, he said finally. Not until we get farther, not while there's light. I would never forgive myself if we didn't get Binnebic to Naglamond, especially if he... I know, Simon, but I don't think we can make it all the way over the top tonight. Maria kicked a stone, sending it rolling into the tall grass beside the paving tiles. She winced. I have more blisters on one foot than I've had in my whole life before this. And it can't be good for Binnebic to bounce on the wolf's back all night. She met his eyes. If he's even going to live... You've done everything anybody could do, Simon. It's not your fault. I know, he replied angrily. Let's walk. We can talk about it while we're moving. They trudged on. It did not take long for the wisdom of Maria's words to become uncomfortably obvious. Simon, too, was so scratched and blistered and scuffed that he wanted to lie down and weep. A different Simon... Simon, that had lived his castle boy life in the labyrinthine hayhole, would have lain down. He would have sat on a stone and demanded dinner and sleep. He was somewhat different now. He still hurt, but there were other things that were more important. Still, there was no good to be done by crippling them all. At last, even Kantaka began to favor one of her legs. Simon was finally ready to give in when Maria spotted another light on the spine of the hill. This one was no sun reflection. Blue twilight was settling over the slopes. Torches, Simon groaned. You sirees, why now when we're almost there? That's probably why. That Ingen monster must have headed for the top of the stile to wait for us. We must get away from the road. Hearts stone heavy, they quickly made their way off the stile's paving and down into a gully that ran along the width of the hill. They scurried on, stumbling frequently in the fading light until they found a little clearing no wider than Simon was tall, protected by a stockade of young hemlocks. As he looked up one last time before ducking into the cover of the high brush, Simon thought he saw the gleaming eyes of several more torches winking on the hilltop. May those bastards burn in hell, he snarled breathlessly, crouching to untie Binnebeck's limp form from Kantaka's back. Adon, you sirees, Adon, how I wish I had a sword or a bow. Should you take Binnebeck off? Maria whispered. What if we have to run again? Then I'll carry him. Besides, if it comes to running, we might as well give up now. I don't think I could run fifty steps. Could you? Maria ruefully shook her head. They took turns swigging at the water skin while Simon massaged Binnebeck's wrists and ankles, trying to get some blood back into the troll's chill extremities. The little man was breathing better now, but Simon did not feel confident that would last long. A thin film of bloody saliva bulged in and out of his mouth with each breath. And when Simon skinned back the little man's eyelids as he had once seen Dr. Morgenes do with a fainting chambermaid, the whites of the troll's eyes seemed quite gray. As Maria fished about in the pack for something to eat, Simon tried to lift one of Kantaka's paws to see why she was limping. The wolf stopped panting long enough to bare her teeth and snarl at him in a very convincing manner. When he tried to pursue the investigation, she snapped at his hand, jaws clashing hard not an inch from his probing fingers. Simon had almost forgotten she was a wolf and had grown used to handling her as though she were one of Tobias's ha Tobias's hounds. He was suddenly grateful that she had chastened him so mildly. He left her alone to tongue-wash her ragged pads. The light dwindled pinpoint stars blooming in the thickening darkness overhead. Simon was chewing a piece of hard biscuit Maria had found for him and wishing he had an apple or anything with juice in it. 
when a thin, clamoring noise began to untangle itself from the song of the evening's first crickets. Simon and Maria looked at each other then for the confirmation that they did not really need to Kantaka. The wolf's ears were swung forward, her eyes alert. Uh, by the way, we've got like four minutes left in the hour, but probably about ten minutes of reading, and I'm going to go ahead and finish since we lost so much time messing about with the, um, uh, with the sound and other things. The wolf's ears were swung forward, her eyes alert. There was no need to name the creatures that made that faraway baying noise, both of them were far too familiar with the sounds of hunting hounds at full cry. What? What should... Maria started to ask, but Simon shook his head. He banged his fist in frustration against the trunk of a tree and absently watched blood rise on the back of his pale knuckles. In a few minutes, they would be in full darkness. There's nothing we can do, he hissed. If we run, we will only make more of a track for them to follow. He wanted to lash out again, to break something. Stupid, 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 this whole bloody adventure. And to what end? As he sat, fuming, Maria pushed in close against his side, lifting his arm and draping it around her shoulder. I'm cold, was all she said. He wearily leaned his head against hers, tears of frustration and fear welling in his eyes as he listened to the noises from the hillside above. Now he thought he could hear men's voices shouting back and forth above the din of the hounds. What he would give for a sword. Unskilled as he was, he could at least cause them some pain before they took him. Gently, he lifted Maria's head from his shoulder and bent forward. As he had remembered, Benebic's skin bag was nestled at the bottom of the pack. He pulled it out and ran his fingers through it, searching by touch alone in the obscurity of the clearing. Searching by touch alone in the obscurity of the clearing. What are you doing? Maria whispered. Simon found what he was seeking and closed his hand on it. Some of the noises were now coming from the hillside north of them, too, almost at their level of the slope. The trap was closing. Hold Kentaka. He got up and crawled a short distance, scouring the brush until he found a good-sized broken branch, a thick one longer than his arm. He brought it back and upended Binnebeck's bag of powder on it, then laid it down carefully. I'm making a torch, he said, pulling out the troll's flints. Won't that just lead them to us? the girl asked, a note of detached curiosity in her voice. I won't light it until I have to he replied. But at least we'll have something, something to fight with. Her face was in shadow, but he could sense her eyes on him. She knew exactly how much good such a gesture would do them. He hoped, and the hope was very strong, that she would understand why it was a necessary gesture. The ferocious uproar of the dogs was horribly close now. Simon could hear the sounds of the bushes being beaten down and the loud cries of the hunters. The sound of branches snapping grew louder just above them on the hillside and approaching rapidly. Too loud a noise for dogs, Simon thought, heart fluttering as he smacked flint against stone. It, it must be men on horseback. The powder sparked but did not catch. The underbrush was crackling as though a wagon was tumbling through it end over end. Catch! Damn you, catch! Something smashed through the thicket just above their hiding place. Maria's hand clutched his arm hard enough to cause pain. Simon! she cried, and then the powder sputtered and flared. A wavering orange flower blossomed at the tip of the branch. Simon leaped up, swinging it out at the end of his arm, the flames rippling. Something crashed out of the trees. Kantaka pulled free of Maria's grasp, howling. Nightmare. That was all Simon could think as he lifted the torch. The light reached out, illuminating the thing that stood, startled upright before him. It was a giant. In the horrifying, static instant that followed, Simon's mind struggled to absorb what his eyes saw. 
the thing that towered above him, swaying in the torch glare. At first he thought it some kind of bear, for it was covered all over in pale, shaggy fur. But no, its legs were too long, its arms and black-skinned hands too human. The top of its hairy head was three cubits above Simon's, as it leaned forward at the waist, eyes squinting in its leathery, man-like face. The baying was everywhere, like the music of a ghastly choir of demons. The beast lashed out a long, taloned arm, tearing the flesh of Simon's shoulder, rocking him backward so that he stumbled and almost dropped the torch. The darting light of its flames briefly illuminated Maria. <coughs> Excuse me. The darting light of its flames briefly illuminated Maria, eyes wide with horror as she clutched Benebic's limp form, trying to drag him back out of the way. The giant opened its mouth and thundered. That was the only possible word for the echoing rumble that came out, and lunged at Simon again. He leaped away, catching his foot on something and toppling over, but before the thing could move forward, could move toward him, its chest rattling growl turned into a howl of pain. It fell forward, half slumping to the ground. Kentaka had caught it behind a shaggy knee, a gray shadow dashing back to leap again at the giant's legs. The beast snarled and swiped at the wolf, missing her once. The second time, its broad hand caught her. She tumbled over and over into the brush. The giant turned back to Simon. But even as he hopelessly raised the torch before him and saw its pulsing light reflected in the giant's glossy black eyes, a boiling mass of shapes came through the undergrowth, howling like the wind in a thousand high turrets. They seethed around the giant like an angry ocean. Dogs everywhere, leaping and biting at the huge creature as it raged in its thunderstorm voice. It windmilled its arms and broken bodies flew away. One knocked Simon to the ground, his torch skittering, but five more leaped in to fill the place of each one dislodged. Even as Simon crawled to the torch, his mind a jumble of insane, feverish pictures, light suddenly bloomed everywhere. The vast shape of the beast reeled around the clearing, roaring, and then men came, and there were horses rearing and people shouting. A dark shape leaped over Simon, knocking his torch away once more. The horse slid to a halt just beyond, the rider standing atop his mount with a long spear flicking in and out of the torchlight. A moment later, the spear, the spear, a moment later, the spear was a great black nail standing out from the breast of the besieged giant, who gave a last shuddering roar and slipped down beneath the convulsing blanket of hounds. The horseman dismounted. Men with torches ran past him to pull the dogs off. The light revealed the horseman's profile, and Simon climbed to one knee. Joshua, he said, then pitched forward. His last sight was the prince's spare face limbed in the yellow light of torch flames, eyes widening in surprise. Time came and went in fitful moments of waking and darkness. He was on a horse in front of a silent man who smelled of leather and sweat. The man's arm was a stiff band around Simon's middle as they swayed up the stile. The horse's hooves clopped on stone and he found he was watching the swinging tail of the horse before him. There were torches everywhere. He was looking for Maria, for Benebic, for everyone else. Where were they all? Some kind of tunnel was all around now, stone walls echoing with the rippling sound of heartbeats. No, hoofbeats. The tunnel seemed to go on forever. A great wooden door set in the stone loomed before them. It swung open, slowly, torchlight flooding out like water through a burst dam, and the shapes of many men were in the spreading light of the entrance. And now they came down a long slope in the open air, the horses single file, a glimmering snake of torches winding down the path ahead as far as he could see. 
All around them was a field of bare earth planted with nothing but naked bars of iron. Below them, the walls were lined with more torches, the sentries staring up at the procession descending from the hills. The stone walls were before them, now level, now slowly rising up past their heads as they followed the trail downward. The night sky was dark as the inside of a barrel, but salted with stars. Head bobbing, Simon found himself sliding back down into sleep, or the dark sky. It was hard to tell which. Naglemond, he thought, as the light of the torches splashed on his face, and the men shouted and sang on the walls above. Then he was falling away from the light, and darkness covered him like a drift of ebony dust. And that's the end for tonight's extremely complicated <laughs> reading. Not the reading itself, which was not so complicated, uh, but the static problems. Well, we're going to try again. Yeah, this other microphone is really a nice one and very expensive, and there's no reason it should be doing these things, but I'll see if I can figure it out. Um, anyway... Back next week, as far as I know, um, and I will, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty sure I will be doing my regular readings at my regular time. We are beginning part three of the Dragonbone Chair, because that ended part two, uh, or book two, or whatever it's called, I can't remember. Um, until that point, I thank you, I thank you for your patience, um, and I appreciate your presence and your calm goodwill while I'm messing with all of this technical crapola. Um, ay, 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 ay. What a day, what a week, what a month, what a year. Anyway, so again, I thank you. Um, I say peace unto you. Take good care of yourselves. Take, take good care of your friends and neighbors and of course your loved ones. And I will see you next week. Um, first uh, one o'clock Sunday morning, Pacific Daylight time? No, Pacific Standard Time. We're back to Standard Time. And then at uh, 7 p.m., also Pacific Standard Time. So again, good night. Thank you for the patience. And have fun. Be good to yourselves. And I will see you very soon. Bye.